When an Indian child has been brought up among us, taught our language and habituated to our customs, yet if he goes to see his relations and makes one Indian ramble with them, there is no persuading him ever to return. And that this is not natural only to Indians, but as men, is plain from this, that when white persons of either sex have been taken prisoners young by the Indians, and lived a while among them, though, ransomed by their friends, and treated with all imaginable tenderness to prevail with them to stay among the English. Yet within a short time they become disgusted with our manner of life, and the care and pains that are necessary to support it, and take the first good opportunity of escaping again into the woods, from whence there is no reclaiming them. Franklin followed with an example. He had heard of a person who had been reclaimed from the Indians and returned to a sizable estate. Tired of the care needed to maintain such a style of life, he had turned it over to his younger brother and, taking only a rifle and a match coat, took his way again to the wilderness. Franklin used this story to illustrate his point that, no European who has tasted savage life can afterwards bear to live in our societies. Such societies, wrote Franklin, provided their members with greater opportunities for happiness than European cultures. Continuing, he said, The care and labor of providing for artificial and fashionable wants, the sight of so many rich wallowing in superfluous plenty, whereby so many are kept poor and distressed for want, the insolence of office, the restraints of custom, all contrive to disgust them with what we call civil society. With so many white people willingly becoming associated with Indian societies, it was not difficult for thoughts and customs practiced behind the frontier to leak back into the colonies. Franklin's interest in America's indigenous peoples was not restricted to their social and political systems. Like many European and American scientists of his time, Franklin was interested in tracing the origins of these natural men, who figure so importantly in the thought of the Enlightenment. Since they were believed to be living in a state that approximated the origins of all peoples, Indians made fascinating objects of scientific study. Franklin, an anthropologist before the discipline had a name, engaged in the collection of Indian grammars, an activity practiced on both sides of the Atlantic during the 18th century. By the end of the century, missionaries, natural scientists, and others had produced dozens of grammars in many Indian languages of varying length and accuracy one indication of the Enlightenment era's intense fascination with the peoples of the New World. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and others collected the grammars and searched for words that might resemble concepts or phrases in English, French, German, Welsh, Yiddish, or other European languages. Many popular theories supposed that various Indian tribes might have descended from the Welsh, or the Jews, or the Celts, and linguistic ties were believed to support those theories. As a scientist Franklin also vigorously opposed degeneracy theories, an intellectual export from Europe. These theories were developed to their highest form in France as a reaction to the myth of the noble savage, which flourished in the same nation at the same time. According to the theory of degeneracy, America's climate degraded all life forms that existed there. Plants, animals, Indians, and transplanted Europeans were all said to be subject to this debilitating influence. Franklin thought otherwise. In 1772, he replied to assertions by de Pas and Count de Buffon, writing to an unnamed French friend. Les Americains ne le sedent ni en force, ni en courage, ni en d'esprit aux Européens. Franklin had too much personal contact to accept either the conception of the noble savage or the degeneracy argument. Unlike the Europeans who argued over land and people most of them had never seen, Franklin knew both well and this knowledge produced in his writings about America and American Indians a pragmatism that many Europeans lacked. The savage, wrote de Buffon, is feeble and has small organs of generation. He has neither hair nor beard, and no ardor whatever for his female. To de Buffon, Indians were also, less sensitive, and yet more timid and cowardly, with, no activity of mind. If not forced to move in order to survive, Indians, will rest stupidly, lying down for several days. Indians, wrote de Buffon, look upon their wives, only as beasts of burden. The men, in de Buffon's analysis, lacked sexual capacity. Nature, by refusing him the power of love, has treated him worse and lowered him deeper than any animal. To Jefferson, de Buffon who had never seen America, nor the Indians he wrote about presented a fat and inviting target. Jefferson replied that no correlation existed between sexual ardor and the amount of body hair on a man. With them it is disgraceful to be hairy on the body. They say it likens them to hogs. They therefore pluck the hair as fast as it appears," Jefferson wrote. He recounted Indians' bravery in war to refute de Buffon's assertion that they were timid and cowardly, 
and he cited examples of Indian oratory to show that America's natives were not mentally deficient. While Jefferson believed that Indians' sexual equipment and drive was not less than that of whites, he wondered whether constant hunting and the Indians' diet might have diminished those natural gifts. What raised such a question in his mind, Jefferson did not say. As with many scientific debates through the ages, the emotional exchanges between Europeans and Americans over the degeneracy theories reflected the political and social conflicts of the age. In the writings of Franklin there seems to be an emerging awareness of a distinctive American habit of mind, a sense that these transplanted Europeans, himself included, were becoming something not inferior to Europeans, but something very different. As the debate over degeneracy theories was taking place, more and more Americans were, like Franklin, coming to conclude that history and dignity demanded the colonies become a separate nation. Franklin more than once rushed to the defense of America and things American. When British publishers derided American cuisine, he hurried into print with a defense of American, Indian, corn, replete with recipes. When French authors peddled fantasies about the wildness of America and the savagery of its native inhabitants, Franklin set up a press in Passy and issued from it essays on the virtues of America and Americans, white and red. During the decade after the Stamp Act, Franklin's writings developed into an argument for American distinctiveness, a sense of nationhood in a new land, a sense that an entirely new age was dawning for the Americans who traced their roots to Europe. The new nation would not be European, but American combining both heritages to make a specifically different culture. Franklin and his contemporaries, among whom one of the most articulate was Jefferson, were setting out to invent a nation. Before they could have a nation, however, they had to break with Britain, an act that called for an intellectual backdrop for rebellion, and a rationale for revolution, one. C. Peter Gay, Enlightenment Thought and the American Revolution, in John R. Howe Jr., ed. The Role of Ideology in the American Revolution, New York, Holt, Reinhardt and Winston, 1970, page 48. Native American Anthology. Iroquois Constitution. The League was unique in that it was extraordinarily well-planned and defined than any other Native American confederacy. It was based on a constitution which thoroughly outlined the methods for choosing leaders and conducting business. Its more salient aspects include a decision-making apparatus for making decisions among the various nations, its stress on ceremony, ritual, and structure over individual leadership, and its provisions for secession and inclusion of Native American nations. Each of the nations was to send three lords to the meeting place among the Onondaga. Two of these lords could speak while the third could only speak to indicate procedural mistakes. Decisions would be made in the following way. The Mohawk and Seneca lords would have to unanimously agree on a course of action. They sent these decisions to the Oneida and Cayuga lords, who would also have to unanimously agree on this decision. If they didn't agree on it, they would forge their own decision which would also require unanimity. This alternative decision would be sent back to the Seneca and the Mohawk for their approval. The process would continue until both sets of nations agreed on a single principle. At that point, the decision would be sent to the Onondaga, who were called the Fire Keepers, since they maintained their meeting place. If they agreed to the course of action, it would then be taken. If they refused it, they would return their own decision to the four nations who would then forge a new decision. Once those four nations agreed unanimously, the decision was officially made. It was this procedure, which required absolute unanimity, which separated the Iroquois League from others, for no single individual could dominate the proceedings. It was the structure of the proceeding itself that produced decisions. Finally, the League was considered open-ended. Any nation could be thrown out of the League, any nation could secede, and any nation could join provided they agreed to the Constitution. It is perfectly obvious how the framers of the Constitution of the United States borrowed from the Iroquois League. The two houses of Congress are based on the Roman model of the Senate and the Plebeian Assembly, but added to this model is the give and take between the two houses in the effort to enforce common consent between the two houses which is borrowed from the Iroquois Constitution. The veto power of the President clearly derives from the function of the Onondaga Lords as firekeepers, and the open-endedness of the League is reproduced in the open-endedness of the Constitution. Any state can join, any state can secede, and, potentially, any state can be withdrawn from the nation. The United States government, in the family of nations, with its official, A, 1782 present, seal of the United States, 4 U.S.C.S., Sec. 41, and, B. Private and National, Flag of the United States, 4 U.S.C.S., C.H.P.T. 1, Sec. 1, 
is the Aboriginal General and Republican legitimate and sovereign of the United States of America, ordained and established, prior to 1787, by the people of the United States, according to the preamble, Constitution for, of the United States of America and the Law of Nations. This free Republican democracy is not a democratic federal government. The CUSA makes no mention of a federal government management, however it does authorize and lawfully indicate our Republican form of government, Art. 4. Sec. 4. CUSA, aka, we, the people of the United States, Repubilca, i.e., a government of the people, for the people and by the people. Our national government is a part of the old federal, confederal father. Lat. Fides and Fiatus, aka, the confederations, Art. 6. CLS 1. Our general constitutional three-branch United States government, legislative, judicial and executive are not the federal administrative legislative, judicial and executive departmental governments in the United States general government. Our constitutional general United States government headed principally by the people of the United States, the Congress of the United States, not to be confused with the U.S. Congress, is authorized by and a continuation of the United States in general Congress assembled, aka the Congress of the United States assembled, pursuant to, but not limited to, the law of nations, ordained by the family of nations. The Law of Nations, Art. 1, Sec. 8 CLS. 10, is superior to what is now known as, international law. Simply stated the Law of Nations is international Muslim, not to be confused with Muslim or Islamic law. See Muslim law and customary, Black's Law Dict. 4 6 ed. Customary common law which comprises the body of the principles and rules of actions, relating to the government and security of persons and property which derive their authority solely from usages and customs of immemorial antiquity, so ancient, as to be beyond human memory, time out of mind, or from judgments and decrees of courts recognizing, affirming, and enforcing such usages and customs. The law of nations is said to have been esoterically to have been created by the celestial beings, masters, or empire, the gods who lay down the law, rules for terrestrial, modern man, or more man out of Afmoriga, Africa and Amoriga, i.e., Africa and America over 100,000 years ago.